I have a distinct honor to introduce the next guest speaker. And she also traces her lineage, her origin to Ghana. <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, her husband is also from, originally from Ghana. Okay, so that's very good. Um, our next, <laughs> that is very perfect, yes, yes. Um, the next speaker is Dr. Olive Hemmings, and she has been professor for more than 30 years. She has been teaching graduate and undergraduate programs. She has master's degree in biblical languages and New Testament from Andrews University, and she also has her doctorate degree from Clement Graduate University. PhD in theology. And recently, she has publication on sacred test and social conflict in a, in, in a case study of the debate over women ordination. And she's also a professor at Washington Adventist University. So let's welcome Dr. Hemmings. Good afternoon, everyone. What an honor to be here presenting with these erudite British scholars. Uh, I find, as I sat there and listened, uh, since, even since last evening, I realized that this work of the Spirit is a miraculous thing. Because these presentations have simply set the groundwork for what I'm about to present myself. And these are the historians, the lecturers. Now, I know that you have been uh, spoiled and pampered with these erudite lectures, and this is what the British do. Uh, but uh, I need to let you know that lecturing is not my pedagogical uh, mode. I, my pedagogy is conversation and kerygma. I think it's a West Indian style. So we got the British style, today we get the West Indian style. <laughs> so thank you all for having me. Thank uh, Dr. Weigley for putting his trust in me on this matter. Uh, Dr. Weigley, wonderful person. We, traveled across China a couple of years ago with Michelle down there and Dr. Spence, it was so wonderful. This is just such a righteous man. I, I pray that you give him praises while he's still alive. Now scriptures, my topic, the scriptures as weapon, the word as life. Sometimes we refer to the scriptures in singular terms, scripture. But in the Bible is high graphi, literally the writings that we uh, call scriptures. And scriptures refer to any body of sacred texts. For the Muslim, it's the Quran. For the Jews, it's the Torah. For the Judeo-Christian, it is the Bible. But what is the word of God? From a strictly biblical, scriptural, standpoint, scripture and the word of God is not one and the same thing. Now, please note that uh, the presenters this morning were historians, and thank God for the groundwork they set. I am a theologian, a biblical theologian, and that's the perspective we'll see this evening. And we'll see how the Holy Spirit weaves all of these presentations together. The scriptures, and in our case, as I say, the Bible, witnesses to or points us to the word, but it is not the word. John 5.39 and I'm going to read John 5.39 straight from the Greek text based on 
the grammar and the syntax. You perpetually search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, but they are what testify about me. And this is how John begins his gospel. The word. The word, the logos, was in beginning. Again, I'm reading straight from the Greek text based on the syntax and the grammar. The word, the logos, was in beginning, and the word was by nature God. All things came into existence through it, and apart from it, not a single thing occurs. What came in it was life, and the life was the light of humanity. And the logos became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. Now, friends, from here on out, I would like you to disabuse yourself of the English term word. Word in English literally does not capture the meaning of logos in John. We will see this as this conversation develops. What we will see in the writings of John is that the word, the logos, embodies five fundamental elements of being as the very spirit of life. We saw Dr. Myers spoke about from Luther's writing. These elements are beginning, arche, God, theos, life, zoe, love, agape, and light or truth. Aletheia. Well, there's another word for light, force, and aletheia. In the philosophical context of John, these point to the very nature of existence and human responsibility. Now, Martin Luther argued for this distinction between scripture and the word, and I, we heard Dr. Uh, uh, um, Dr. Ryer, <laughs> uh, I forget the word, yes, presenting us with this attempt by Luther to make this distinction between scripture and the word. Luther scholar Kenneth Hagen argues that for Luther, Christ is not one meaning in the scripture. Rather, Christ is the reality of the truth of God. Luther says, whatever does not teach Christ is certainly not apostolic, even if St. Peter or St. Paul teaches it. Whatever preaches Christ would be apostolic, even if it were presented by Judas, Annas, Pilate, and Herod. This is the thing. As long as we can equate scripture with the word, we can also weaponize it and shape it into an instrument of institutional control by which it becomes the foundation of divisiveness and rancor. And we know that in many quarters in Christendom, the Bible has been used as a beating stick. It has been used to beat women in subjection, keep them in their places. Use and abuse of scripture. The scripture and women have that in common, use and abuse. For five centuries, the so-called Protestant method of Bible interpretation has served competing ideological, doctrinal, cultural, and ecclesiological interests with, with no clear end in sight. However, it is important to note that the principle of sola scriptura was in essence not a concern for method of interpretation. The overarching concern was to encounter Christ, the Logos, as the sole authority and telos, end of scripture. It is important that we remember why the Reformation advocated for sola scriptura. This is an important thing we need to remember. Why did they advocate for sola scriptura? They wanted everyone to access the content of scripture because the church stood between the Bible and the people. This is because the church understood the content of the Bible to be deeply mystical. Therefore, only special leaders gifted with a spiritual insight could interpret it. 
From such a standpoint, the church was able to place arbitrary and self-serving meanings upon the scriptures. And church dogma and traditions took priority over the Bible. But this is the irony here. What the Reformation sought to undo, namely the Catholic Church's control over the Bible and its meaning, ironically becomes more widespread and entrenched in Protestantism. Today in Protestantism, various Christian denominations lay claim to their particular interpretation of scripture as the truth. And some employ coercive means to maintain such. Even Luther himself lost his vision and became guilty of this. Luther wanted death penalty for the Anabaptists who held to believers baptism rather than infant baptism. As a result, sola scriptura has morphed into a sometimes rabid, rabid bibliolatry. Bibliolatry is deification of the Bible. We build a shrine around the Bible that no one dares to breach. Let me correct that. Each denomination builds a shrine around its particular interpretation of the Bible that no one dares to breach. This bibliolatry, this false deification of the Bible tends to produce Bible scholars and preachers who walk around the Bible as though walking on eggshells for fear of losing their livelihood or position in the mainstream of the denomination. Some preachers hold up the Bible in their hands while they preach around it. And others open it up so cautiously. You'd think there are IEDs in the book. There are IEDs for sure, but not in this holy writ. There are no IEDs in it. The IEDs lay in the creeds and policies using the Bible as proxy. Sorry, friends, I'm a preacher. <laughs> My fellow servants in Christ, it will take courage and patience to detonate these explosive devices. But it must be done if the word of God is to manifest in its full splendor. Protestant or Protestant bibliolatry is the exploitation of the religious cultural power of scripture to stem this dissent under the pretext of biblical authority. It leaves many proponents of sola scriptura on a treadmill, well worked out, each using scripture to prove their particular point of view, but no, going nowhere in freeing the pure light of scripture from dogmatic, ideological, and institutional control. Exhibit A, Theology of Ordination Study Committee. Our reputable scholars approach the study based on the presumption of sola scriptura. Reputable scholars. We know they are reputable because I was not part of that committee. No, they are reputable scholars. <laughs> but in spite of their diligence, institutional authority won out and the conclusion of the study came to naught. If this is true, that the light of scripture flickers under the bushel basket of institutional control, then the Reformation quest remains largely unfulfilled. And our work as preachers, teachers, church leaders, and scholars remain before us. My purpose here is to examine the extent to which the scriptures point to the word and perhaps capture the Reformation ideal of sola scriptura in its advocacy for Christ, the logos, the truth, and the end of scripture. I examine this based on the logos philosophy in the writings of John. By the way, Martin Luther did extensive commentary on John because he saw it there. 
So I examined this based on this Logos philosophy in John, and out of this, I propose to construct a Logos hermeneutic. To embrace the word of God is to embrace a profound ethic of oneness in being as the one consistent liberating principle in the Bible. This principle was a working hermeneutic of Jesus of Nazareth, Paul of Tarsus, and the Hebrew prophets before him. It is a hermeneutic of liberation. And friends, by liberation, I'm not referencing some kind of political ideology. Rather, I am, by the grace of God, channeling the voice of the prophets of old, stoned, imprisoned, and executed because they tend to the gaping holes in institutionalized religiosity. But before we go on, there are two sola scriptura principles that I would like to clarify because these often become distorted in the rush to weaponize the Bible. First principle, scripture is its own authority and its own interpreter. Now people take this to mean proof text interpretation. This is not what it means. It doesn't mean one use a concordance and match words with words in different texts without any regard for the literary or historical context. Such approach opens up the scripture to distortion and manipulation. What the reformers mean is that there's a working principle in the Bible that judges the very content of the Bible. Luther, Calvin, argue that it is the spirit of Christ present within the text that interprets the text, not the external interpreter. Luther argues, if you take Christ from the scripture, what else do you find in it? So if a passage appears obscure, it is not making, if it's not making sense based on what we understand to be right and true and just, what Luther says, shine the light of Christ upon it. There needs to be no mystical silence. This is the thing. Often when we conclude that the Bible is silent on a matter, the powerful of the church tends to fill in the silence with the noise of their own power agendas. Exhibit B, the case of women's ordination. The Bible and the spirit of prophecy, silent on the matter, they say. But how many have attended to the spirit of Christ in the Bible on this matter? Has not Apostle Paul pointed us to the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 11, nevertheless in the Lord? The only head is God. We have silenced the voice of the Spirit. Human culture of domination continues to shut out the word. So the Bible, we call it the Christian canon, right? But what does canon mean? It means measuring rod, what we measure as authoritative. But Luther clarifies this idea of canon. According to Luther, it's not the Bible itself that is the measuring rod or the canon. It is Christ, the Logos, the Word. The Logos is the only absolute truth against which everything in the Bible itself may be judged. So let me repeat Luther's radical statement. Whatever does not teach Christ is certainly not apostolic, even if St. Peter or St. Paul teaches it. Whatever preaches Christ would be apostolic, even if it were presented by Judas, Annas, Pilate, and Herod. The second principle I want us to clarify here is the principle that scripture has a literal meaning or a plain sense. Now, the Reformation idea of plain sense does not mean blind literalism, regardless of context or regardless of all the other factors and background knowledge necessary to clarify the text. 
The reformers oppose a subjective, arbitrary interpretation that according to Origen of Alexandria, the famous first century Christian, uh, third century Christian scholar, requires special spiritual insight by select people to decipher the meaning of the objects, parts, and elements of scripture. This mystification gave the church sole authority over the scripture to determine their meanings. Luther's protest, he, protest here is that there is nothing unclear in scripture. He argues that many passages in scripture are obscure and hard to elucidate, but it is not due to the exalted nature of the subject. It's due rather to our linguistic and grammatical ignorance, and it does not prevent in any way our knowing all the content of scripture. So by plain sense, the reformers mean to recover the real meaning of the biblical text from the mystification and arbitrary subjectivism of medieval Christianity. So by plain sense, the reformers sought to wrest the scriptures from the death grip of the church. So let me summarize this brief but necessary excursus on sola scriptura. The reformation understanding of the Bible as its own interpreter is not literalistic, anti-intellectual, or even constrained contextual, contextual approach to the Bible. And I say even constrained because often interpreters attend to context only when it suits their agenda. They discard context when it puts the floodlight upon entrenched beliefs and practices. Allowing scripture to interpret scripture is not proof text interpretation. There can be no consistent outcome to scripture with this approach because it allows the interpreter to harvest the religious cultural power of the text towards particular beliefs, interests, and ideologies. And the authority exert exerted is not that of the scripture, but that of the interpreter. This eclipses the reconciling power of the Bible's own interpreter, namely the Logos, the Christ, and transforms scripture into a weapon of control. Now, we are most of us here called to be ministers of the word. Isn't that so, friends? Prophets. That's what ministers of the word are, prophets. And just in case anyone in my hearing has not received the biblical memo, the priesthood as an office or institution is dead. There are no popes. Uh, don't mind that, friends. That, is, that was for me. Um, that's, that's a caution for me, not for you. So as prophets, our primary witness must be to the word and nothing else. Not to our policies not to our doctrines, not to our particular ideologies, not to particular cultural mindsets and practices. I know some people may stone me, but it has to be said. For if our primary service is to these, we become blind to the word. We become false prophets. And we continue to weaponize the scriptures. So let me repeat. By word, I do not mean scriptures, because the scriptures, high graphi, and the word, whole logos, are not one and the same thing. I write in the Greek here, so my Greek students need to know impo how important it is to attend to their Greek. <laughs> and those of you who throw away your Greek books after you finish college, I want you to feel sorry. All right. So let me repeat, the scriptures, high graphi, and the word, whole logos, are not one and the same thing. In John, the scriptures testify to the word. In the Johannine conversation, truth, aletheia, re resides in the logos. And the logos is being of God, and the logos incarnates in Jesus of Nazareth. So the scriptures are not ends in and of themselves. Rather, the Logos is the end of scripture. Logos is the spirit, not the letter of scripture. 
Luther struggled to find this logos in his many sermons and lectures. He seemed to have found it, but he lost it in the end. And that's a whole other conversation which I will not take up today. Now the debate over the scriptures versus the word, high graphi versus whole logos, or, is a first century debate between church and synagogues. That debate began in the first century between the church and the synagogue. Now it is very important to understand that what became the church was initially part of the synagogue. As the Jesus followers continued to push the boundaries of scriptures on matters such as circumcision, dietary laws, observance of days, social mingling, and so forth, conflict ensued. And by the end of the first century, Jesus followers and synagogue became separate and the debate and even bitterness intensified. The four gospels, friends, the four gospels in varying degrees reflect this debate. Read the seven woes in Matthew chapter 23 to see how bitter the debate had become. Woe to you, blind guys. We see it developing in Matthew as Jesus comes up on the mountain as a new Moses to teach. You have heard it said, but I say. And then he summarizes the entire scriptures in everything. Do to others as you'd have them do to you. This is the law and the prophets. The point of the Sermon on the Mount is that any interpretation of scripture must reflect love, justice. This is a hermeneutic of spirit, not letter. It is a hermeneutic of life, logos hermeneutic that John reflects. In it was life, and the life was the light of humanity. In the Gospels, Jesus seeks to correct the use and abuse of scripture in his own religious tra tradition. The interpretation of scriptures was in, his, was in the hands of a few scribes and Pharisees who used it for social control and to protect and propagate an egoistic self-identity devoid of true righteousness. The people were amazed because Jesus taught as one with authority and not as the scribes, Matthew 14, 28 to 29. Apostle Paul was the vanguard in applying Jesus' approach to scripture. It was radical. Don't be afraid of the word radical, friends. Some people are afraid of it. It's a good word. It means root, the real stuff, not the superficial. So Paul writes, Oh, no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. This directly reflects Jesus' approach to scripture. And yes, Paul is references is Paul is referencing the traditional approach to scripture. He says in chapter 24, or in chapter, it says in Romans chapter 2, verse 14, when the Gentiles who do not possess the law, and here he's referring to Torah, the scriptures, when the Gentiles who do not possess scriptures do instinctively what it requires, these, though not having the scriptures, are a law unto themselves. What does the law require, friends? What does the law require? Ah, love your neighbor as yourself. In everything, do unto others. This is to say that the spirit of scriptures transcends the scripture. It cannot be the possession of any one group, of any one culture, of any one religion, or any one tradition. You cannot lock up the spirit in a book. Many of us have not begun to read Paul. We are just tiptoeing around the edges, using his writings to carry out our own agendas. We are repeating history, it seems. Endless cycles of use and abuse of scripture, I think. Now, the debate between church and synagogue climaxes in the fourth gospel and the epistles of the same name attributed to John. We read in John 1 that the Logos, the word, was by nature God, and it became flesh in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. But what does all this really mean? Now, we who read the scripture read it at a disadvantage. We are centuries, millennia even, removed from the text. John's audience did not need the clarification that we now need. 
So let us pretend to be John's original audience. It is an audience steeped in and acquainted with Gnostic philosophy. The content of John shows that John has not himself bought into the philosophy, but he uses the language of the philosophy to explain the concept of the Logos, of its incarnation and its implication for human responsibility. John discusses the Logos within the framework of six fundamental elements of being, as I pointed out earlier, I think I had just five. RK, the Logos was in beginning. Note I didn't say the, in beginning. That's what the text says. Theos, the Logos was with God, and the Logos was the being of God, or the same nature as God. Zoe, in it was life. Aletheia, truth. The Logos became uh, uh, flesh full of grace and truth. 1 verse 14. Agape, love. Those who love abide in God and God in them. 1 John 4, 16b, we have passed from death to life because we love one, and ever, one another. Whoever does not love abides in death. 1 John 3, 14. So what does John's original audience hear when they hear each of these six terms? RK, beginning literally means ground of being. It's not about time, friends. RK in Greek philosophy is the very ground of existence. Aletheia, truth, literally is the state of being unconcealed or remembering. The opposite of aletheia is lethe, which is, means concealment or forgetfulness. So truth, a, lethia, literally the state of being unconcealed or remembering. Now, the source of aletheia in Greek philosophy is not judgment, as in determining what or what, what is right or what is wrong. Rather, it is the source, the source of aletheia is being in and of itself, independent of time and space. Truth as, love, truth as love manifests itself in the darkness of an alienated word, world as remembering of divine being with humanity as in RK, as is the state of being. What John 1, the first prologue of John, is a remembering. It's a moving back to the very ground of our existence, what it is about, and how do we enter back into that life. So the Logos becoming flesh is a remembering of humanity with divinity. A reminder of the nature of being, RK, lost in the quagmires of human tradition. A reminder of the nature of humanity and the ethical demand that memory places upon us. So in John, RK, Theos, Logos, Agape, Phos, and Aletheia coexist as life. The Logos incarnation is the truth calling humanity back into the fellowship of life, remembering. That is why the first epistle of John zeroes in on the call to love. That those who love abide in God and God in them. First John 4, 16. We know we have passed from death to life because we love one another, 1 John 3, 14. What did the chosen people in the first century understand to be truth? That's a very important question in deciding what truth is in John. Truth for the chosen people revolved around the inheritance of the Abrahamic covenant and Judaic self-identity as the people of God. But here in the first century, Israel is a conquered nation, huh? Under Roman rule. So the Abrahamic covenant is in a state of unfulfillment. The promised land is not theirs. So for them, Messiah is to come from the Davidic line to wrest control of Israel from the Romans and to restore Israel's sovereignty. So Messiah is to come and make Israel great again. But Matthew uses the prophetic writings to reinterpret this 
to reinterpret this political idea of Messiah. For the early church, Messiah is a spiritual reality. Messiah is an experience of liberating life into which all are invited. John takes it much, John takes it much further than Matthew when he bases his writings on one central question. What is truth? The truth in John, friends, is not dogma or tradition. In fact, it is anti-dogma, it is anti-tradition. You see, once we fix an idea and nail it down to be forever so, we have closed ourselves off from the immediacy of being, from the power of the eternal spirit. We have blinded ourselves to truth that is perpetually present. Present truth is no longer available to us. So a very key statement in John is this, before Abraham was, I am. John 8, 58. This is, a central, this is the central truth in John. But what does this statement mean again? Now, you know, we have used that statement for particular reasons, but we have to read it in the context of this full-blown church versus synagogue debate in John. Before Abraham was, I am. If one considers this context, John uses this statement to steer his audience away from redundant tradition before Abraham came and to open their consciousness to the immediacy of being, I am, the Logos incarnate. Being is prior to and infinitely exceeds tradition and the scriptures, if you please. As we read further in John, we see that truth is an ethical responsibility, love. It demands, this demands issues from the affirmation of oneness in being. I am. This unity of being is the focus of the Logos hermeneutic in John. I am, presence of God, God present, being in being. The question, what is truth, arises in the trial of Jesus of Nazareth in the first epistle. Uh, uh, let me repeat that. The, the, the question, what is truth, arises in the trial of, of Jesus of Nazareth. In the first epistle, John crafts the debate as a life and death question. This life and death question, what is truth, appears just as Jesus is about to meet a hideous execution based on untruth. Trumped up charges before the Roman authority because his interpretation of scripture does not conform to the de then dominant teachings and traditions of his own religion. But the untruth extends far beyond the trial. The untruth is the ground of a religious way of being based on ecclesiological and political power and the self-preservation that such power demands. Pilate's question, what is truth, is a cliffhanger in the trial drama. It concludes the first trial scene before the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. The question ends the scene without an answer because John has already answered the question for those who are reading carefully his account of the Jesus story. The debate between synagogue and church is a debate between the religious separatist compulsion to exclude and prophetic demand to include. For God so loved the world that everyone who believes, not just Jews, everyone who believes may have eternal life. John 3.16, the central truth in John, is a reinterpretation, or rather a remembering of the Abrahamic covenant and its messianic fulfillment. The beneficiaries of the covenant is not one group of people based on their religious practices, but the whole world. And Messiah is not the servant of a religious superstructure, rather Messiah is the logos of God. I am, being itself, an experience of life, eternal life, into which every human being may enter. In John, this is the truth of which Jesus declares, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So I am is not dogmatic, egoistic assertion by or about Jesus of Nazareth. I am is an assurance of the immanence of the Logos, the very being of God, enfleshed in history and creation. The Logos, being of God, is life available to humanity through one thing, love. I give you a new commandment that you should love one another. God is love and those who abide in God, uh, and those who uh, abide in love abide in God and God abides in them. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love one another. Now John reinforces this truth in the following ways. 
One, John refers to Jesus' miracles as signs, say Maya. Signs that the Logos actually incarnates in the human Jesus. So his overpowering purpose or his overarching purpose that his audience believe that Jesus is Messiah is a profound reinterpretation of the covenant Messiah. Messiah is a Logos, life, an experience available to all humanity so that by believing, everyone may have life in his name. Now, twice in his, his writings, John says no one has ever seen God. John 1.18, no one has ever seen God. It is the only son who has made him known. 1 John 4.12, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. Another set of parallel assertions. Whoever has seen me has seen God. Whoever hates me hates God also. Those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Those who love God must love their brother and sister also. Hope you're getting the picture here. So here is the seldom told truth, plain truth in John. The story of the Logos incarnate is not only the story of God. It is also the story of humanity. This runs counter to the dogmatic, literalistic interpretation of scripture of Jesus' day. The revelation of the Logos incarnate, word of God, is ethical demand, moral responsibility in being to love. This radical ethic of being is the dominant theme of the early church teachings. In Luke's genealogy, Jesus is son of Adam, who is son of God. It's calling us to responsibility. I'm daughter of Eve, daughter of God. In Matthew, love for God is identical to love for one's fellow human. And whatever one does to one's fellow human, one does to God. Paul, the herald of this very Christ ethic to the, ethic to the church, declares that God is one. By that, he exhorts the church to accept the different ways in which Jews and non-Jews practice the faith of Christ. Paul does not say there is one God. No, that's different. He says God is one. To say there is one God suggests competing gods and religious tribalism. But to say God is one is to affirm a radical monotheism that recognizing no other, no competing elements in being, nothing exists outside of God. This is the ethic, or this ethic is the basis of Paul's teaching on righteousness. This is the spirit of the Logos the spirit of truth, embraced only through love. In the Christian moral philosophy of H. Richard Niebuhr, the Christ event is a demonstration of oneness in being, so that all institutions, all religions, all ideological processes, all nations, all cultural activities, and scientific breakthroughs, all life forms, all living experiences connect in the one beyond the many as essential parts of the process of being. It is the spirit by which the early church interpreted and applied scripture. And this is how we today should seek to interpret and apply it even in these controversial times. I call this a logos hermeneutic. A logos hermeneutic, and I'm about to wrap up, a logos hermeneutic is one that embraces the oneness and immediate uh, let me start it over, I'm rushing to finish. <laughs> a logos hermeneutic is one that embraces the oneness and immediacy of being God incarnate. The Jesus story declares that God is present, calling us into full consciousness of being. As such, it approaches scripture from the standpoint of ethics rather than dogma, ideology, and tradition. This embrace is the very faith of Jesus Messiah which manifests itself through love. It is the hermeneutic of Paul of Tharsos and the Hebrew prophets before him. The Hebrew prophets call it justice, the same word we actually translate righteousness in both New Testament and Old Testament. For the prophets, it's all that God requires. In the early church understanding of Jesus' teaching, love, justice is the end of scripture. In everything, do to others as you'd have them do to you, for this is the law and the prophets, Matthew 7, 12. It is the conclusion of Paul's teaching on righteousness. 
Owe no one anything except to love one another. Love is the fulfillment of the law, Romans 13, 8 to 10. Love, justice, is a stamp of God manifested in Jesus of Nazareth, and it is a measuring stick that interprets and judges scripture. It is this hermeneutic, central to the Johannine debate, that pulled the early church to the controversies over application of scripture as the hearers of the gospel became more and more culturally diverse. So let me end there. Let me end with five important implications for a wholesome approach to scriptures. And you can disagree with me. A logos hermeneutic frees scripture from the conditions that interpreters place upon its authenticity. The inspiration of scripture lies in its witness to the logos, not in the means or nature of that witness, which in many places may seem flawed. And if you read scripture very closely, friends, as biblical theologian, you will see them. As E.G. White says, God is not on trial in the Bible. If the logos is the very spirit of life, to deny the reality of various genres and sources of scripture in the interest of a narrow view of inspiration is in the end counterproductive to its unconditional acceptance as a witness to the incarnation. Divine voice is present in every vehicle of human understanding, and the scripture reflects various vehicles. So Bible thumping fundamentalism that requires everything to be literal and accurate, and scripture rejecting liberalism that requires everything to fit its version of reality. Both of these place condition on scripture. The scripture is what it is, human vehicle of divine revelation. And that in and of itself is a witness to the miracle of the Logos incarnation. Any interpretive, second point, any interpretive outcome that violates the fundamental principle of love, justice, violates the spirit of scripture. Interpretation should not serve the interest of some against full affirmation of others. For example, a hermeneutic that justifies even a semblance of domination and subjugation violates the authority of the scripture. The Apostle Paul has passed down a legacy in Logos hermeneutic in this regard. Let me say again, Paul rejects headship ideology. He patiently outlines the headship ideology in 1 Corinthians 11, 3 to 10. And then, friends, in verses 11 to 12, he judges it with the Logos. He says, in the Lord, man is not independent of woman or woman of man, meaning none of them is head of each other. For as woman came from man, so man comes from woman. Everything comes from God. The only head is God. He throws out that hierarchy, lays it on his side. Only God up there. This is to say that in light of the Logos, male headship usurps the sovereignty of God in the creation and perpetuation of a culture of alienation. Further, Paul subverts a Roman household code of domination and subjugation in Ephesians 5, 21, 6, verse 7 by stating, submit to one another out of reference for Christ. He began by subverting the code. He turns it over on its side. It is unsure why so much resource and interpretive rigmarole goes into the reinforcement of a fundamentalist ideology of headship when the plain reading in Christ is right there in the text. I may be wrong. To accept scientific or historical findings that may be running contrary to what appears in scripture, friends, does not necessarily disavow the authority of scripture. Now, I'm going towards some IEDs here, so. To accept scientific or historical findings that may run contrary to what appears in scripture does not necessarily disavow the authority of scripture. To accept the Logos as radically present, being of God, is to affirm all knowledge and understanding of the creation and human affairs as divine revelation. A radical monotheism cannot assign the vast body of knowledge obtained since the close of the biblical canon to some other. In a sense, then, to disregard science may be in and of itself to disregard the true authority of scripture if that authority is the logos. 
Have we learned anything from the case of Galilee and the Roman Catholic Church of his time? Galileo's finding went against what the church believed to be scientific data in the scripture. They tortured and banished him before forcing him to recant. But today, Galileo's findings is fundamental knowledge. The Bible claims no other discipline outside its own discipline. It's witness to the redemptive presence of God in the creative historical process. Scripture testifies that divine revelation fills up time and space. God is present. I am. It seems to be an exercise in futility for scientists to measure the authenticity of scripture with scientific data or for theologians to use scripture to measure the accuracy of science. The church will not soon win that battle if history is to teach anything. What if we prioritize the profound lesson of grace, salvation, and human responsibility in the story of creation over obsession with scientific data? Will we then hear the creation story in ways it yearns to be heard towards renewal and restoration? What if we embrace Sabbath observance as a timeless lesson of the miracle of existence, of human liberation and God's justice as Jesus taught us? Should we subject that life-giving word to scientific debate? Human responsibility and the church's responsibility increases proportionally to the increase of knowledge. Cultural values of the past reflected in scripture emerge from a place of knowledge that is significantly less than the present. This means, friends, that we know a lot more today about the creation and the nature of life than the biblical authors did. To behold Christ in scripture is to embrace what God continues to reveal towards the healing of a culture of alienation. The Logos speaks to divine omniscience, love, justice, providence, and grace out of which a perpetually developing and learning humanity emerges. So let us lay down the weapon we have carved out of the scriptures and walk in the light of the eternal Logos that yearns to incarnate in us. Thank you. Dr. Hemming, thank you very much. I think I'm, I took up the time for questions. Oh, you did, very well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hemmings, for helping us understand the relationship between the word and logos and truth. Do you believe there could be a danger in the future that some could use relativism to argue against the perpetuity of the Seventh-day Sabbath? If Christ supersedes his word rather than embodies the word, could there be a greater danger of a pseudo-Christ declaring a change in the immutability of the fourth commandment, for example? Well, as I said, Christ is the word. So to say Christ supersedes the word, Christ is the word. Uh, the word is, to, is pointing to Christ, the Logos incarnate itself. And, and Sabbath itself, we say Sabbath is, is, is a profound Logos. It, it, it's about liberation. It's about the miracle and the grace uh, of, uh, of creation and salvation. So that's a timeless word that uh, when we are, if we, if we decide we're going to subject it to whether or not the Genesis account of creation is scientific or seven literal days, we, at some point we'll fall into trouble. So that's why we need to embrace this as divine logos, point, a, a, a timeless truth, timeless message of liberation. So when we observe Sabbath, we observe Sabbath, we're not just observing, that's what Jesus spoke against, a literalistic approach the Sabbath by pointing us to the meaning of it. What is it about? When we enter into Sabbath rest, it's symbolic of a life that we live. It is not just the day. It's symbolic of a way of being, you know? I, I, I just want to follow this up with one follow-up question. Yeah. If the Sabbath is merely a celebration of liberation and not a memorial. I would use the word merely, creation and salvation. So, uh, sorry to break you, uh, Exodus version of it is a celebration mainly of creation. Uh, Deuteronomy uh, version is a celebration of liberation. 
Correct. I, I fully agree with that. Yeah. I, I, I feel a little bit um, uncomfortable with the idea of isolating it, maybe, um, to liberation, it, it, because if we don't make it as a memorial of creation, it's going to greatly change our ideas of earth origins. But I don't think, uh, I don't think we, we need to do that at all. I'm not opposing, I don't know that we need to, to oppose its memorial of creation. That's what it's about, creation and liberation. Yeah, fine, I'm yeah. happy that we are in agreement on that. <laughs> yeah. Additional questions? Seeing none, uh, a round of applause for Dr. Hemmings. Thank you very much. <laughs>